Welcome to our next segment of our introduction to Austrian economics. Today we're going to be discussing why socialism was and always will be impossible. In the 19th century, the dominant political philosophy was classical liberalism. Individual rights, private property, free enterprise, free trade, and constitutionally limited government. It brought about a huge transformation in the living conditions and the circumstances and the personal freedom of a multitude of people as these ideas spread over more and more countries and a growing number of parts of the world. But around the middle decades of the 19th century, there emerged a counter-revolution against this individualistic conception of freedom. And this was the rise of collectivism. It took many forms, nationalism, socialism, but whatever, whatever the form, the premise was that the individual was now expected to be subservient to and obedient in the confines of the interests of the collective good, the tribe, the nation, the race, the social class. What was the appeal of this? It was the idea that socialism would bring a better world, a better world than competitive private enterprise, that seemed to be based on individual self-interest, the greedy profit motive, and an unfair and unjust inequality of wealth and income. Now what the socialists promised was to do away with the, with the private ownership of the means of production through socialization, nationalization. That is, they would be taken over by a government that represented and served the interests of all the people in the form of the masses of the workers. And the only people who would suffer were the handful of greedy and unjust and selfish enterprises, businessmen, and capitalists. Once the means of production had been nationalized or socialized by the state in the name of the people, it would then be the responsibility of this socialist people's government to now organize, direct, plan, and bring about the production of all of the real goods and services that people really needed on the basis of need and not merely greed, as they argued. Now, there were critics of this in the 19th century. And those critics of socialism generally made one of two arguments. One, the establishment of socialism threatened to bring about an economic stagnation in the society. They argued that when there's private property, there is a fairly close connection between work and reward. The man who, for example, owns his own business, his own farm, is likely to be more industrious and hardworking in that which is his, because the more successful he is in his industry, the more the profits will be reaped by him. The less industrious, other things held the same, the smaller the reward. Socialism, by taking all of the resources of the society and throwing it into one government planning pot and then ladling out what the collective will have produced under government central planning in a new equality of shares, these critics of socialism argued, would result in the undermining of incentive. Why should I work harder than my neighbors, be as industrious and enterprising as I could be, when no matter how more I work and try to be innovative and creative and productive, I will get no share larger than my neighbor gets. The other argument that the critics of socialism made in those middle and late, late decades of the 19th century is that turning the means of production over to the hands of the government threatened the worst tyranny that man would have ever experienced in history. When the government is the monopoly, it is the only game in town. And then you are dependent upon everything in your life for what the government chooses to give you and the opportunities it will allow. These are powerful arguments, and they have stood the test of time. But there was one element, one argument, that was not raised in its full detail or specificity. And that is, just as a practical matter, could a system of socialist central planning actually work? This came to a head during the years of the First World War, between 1914 and 1918. 
First, when the war broke out and the belligerent nations had to take up arms in the name of winning the war against their respective uh, opponents, all of these major countries in Europe, Germany, Austria, Hungary, Imperial Russia, Italy, France, Great Britain, and then when even the U.S. came into the war later on, all of them introduced forms of government planning and control. Some industries were nationalized, others were just placed under government management and direction. But in all instances, prices and wages were controlled. Production schedules and targets were set. And all business, whether nationalized or still managed technically by private owners, were all expected to bend and serve and fulfill the wartime plans of the belligerent states. In the midst of this conflict, in 1917, a new chapter in the socialist revolutionary idea emerged, and that was a revolution in Russia in November of 1917 by Lenin and the Bolsheviks, and the declaration that they were going to now nationalize the means of production, cl collectivize the land, do away with wage slavery by doing away with the price system, and now introduce war communism of an immediate leap into full central planning. This was a challenge. This was the future now coming as the socialists promised. What would it bring about? The paradise promised or a disaster of economic hardship? In 1920, the Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises published an article, originally in German, called Economic Calculation in the Socialist Commonwealth. This was expanded two years later in 1922 into a book called, in English, Socialism and Economic and Sociological Analysis. In this book, he challenged the socialists with the profound, if somewhat elementary, question. Now that you've nationalized the means of production, now that you've placed all of them under the control of the state, how will you know what consumers want, assuming you, the socialist planners, actually want to serve the interests and the desires of the mass of humanity whom you say you represent as the vanguard of the revolution. How do you know and how will you know what the consumers want? Their relative demands for things, the values they place upon them. And having nationalized the means of production, how will you know the relative values in terms of the opportunity costs of their use in multitudes of productive uses? And which combination of those scarce resources would be, in value terms, the most efficient to get the most out of them to serve the wants of the humanity that you now claim to be serving. Mises reminded the socialists how capitalism did this. With private property, people can use the resources at their disposal as they choose. They can express those choices extensively through the buying and selling of the marketplace. As people buy and sell, they decide what they th think goods and services are worth. They higgle and haggle. Prices are formed. Entrepreneurs can know what, what, co what products consumers want and the values they place upon them. In turn, for private markets of the factors of production, entrepreneurs can know what alternative uses these resources have and their values in these alternative uses as competing entrepreneurs, enterprises, businessmen bid for labor in their different corners of the market for the use of capital, resources, raw material. And this enables the formation of the prices of the factors of production so the entrepreneur can compare two sets of prices now, the prices of output with the prices of input, to have that orientation, that direction that we've earlier talked about of the profit and loss mechanism that gives direction and coordinative potential to all that occurs through production and consumption, supply and demand. Mises says, once you have nationalized the means of production, once you place this in the hands of the government, there are no more markets. Indeed, more fundamentally, with no private property, there's nothing to buy and sell. If people, at least legally, have nothing to buy and sell, they have no motives or incentives to make bids and offers. If they have no motive or ability to make bids and offers, there can be no higgling in the marketplace. If there's no, if there's no higgling and haggling in the marketplace, then there's no agreed upon terms of trade. If there are no agreed upon terms of trade, then there are no prices. 
And if there are no prices, then how does anyone in the market know what consumers want, the value they place upon them, or the relative values and efficient uses of the scarce means of production to see that resources are not being applied for some productive use for which their values are greater in an alternative line of production? Mises says that rather than prosperity and plenty and efficiency and growth and all that socialism would produce in the long run is what he entitled a later little book of his, Planned Chaos. Even if the socialists were angels who only wanted to do good for their fellow men, even if under socialism, in this egalitarian goal of each person sharing commonly, there was no disincentive in people's willingness to be hardworking and industrious, even if all that were taken for granted, the socialist planners would still lack the means of effectively producing, coordinating, integrating, and assuring the effective operation of the economy they had put under their control because of the loss of that essential tool without which economic rationality is lost. Economic calculation, which relies upon private property, competition, resulting money prices, and therefore the estimation of profit and loss. And therefore socialism meant the end of economy and not the beginning of a socialist post-scarcity utopia. This shook, this rattled the socialists who took ideas seriously. They were taken aback. But they soon attempted to devise other arguments. Well, we could play at markets. We could have a form of market socialism. Uh, Mises might have touched upon something correct, but we can devise ways to overcome these handicaps. And so in spite of Mises' challenge, the socialist ideal continued. They would point to the Soviet Union and say, in spite of the brutality of such communist tyrants as Stalin and the Soviet Russia, are they not building things? Is, that near, is there not full employment? Are people not at work creating the industrial future? Planning obviously can somehow in some form work, and surely it's worth giving a chance to have a system better than the greed and selfishness of the decadent capitalist system. Mises's colleague and friend, Friedrich Hayek, who at that time was teaching at the London School of Economics, now responded further by taking Mises's arguments and attempting to refine them and take them in different directions. In 1945, Hayek published an article called The Use of Knowledge in Society. He pointed out that matching the division of labor is an inescapable inherent division of knowledge. In one sense, we all know this commonsensically. There's the butcher and the baker and the candlestick maker. And clearly the butcher knows how to carve up meat, the baker knows how to bake a loaf of bread, and the candlestick maker knows how to take wax and to shape it into illumination. But Hayek said that there's more to the division of knowledge due to division of labor than in that commonsensical sense that we all know and talk about. Indeed, there are many types of knowledge, and all of them are essential and are used by people. And he came to distinguish between three types of knowledge. The first one is what he called scientific or textbook knowledge. This is the kind of knowledge that whether it's in high school or college or graduate school, we learn by reading, studying, mastering literature, learning things from the pages in a book. This is essential knowledge. Certainly we want a doctor to have gone to medical school and have learned anatomy. We want the lawyer to have gone to law school and to know how to present a brief and defend us in a court of law, and to do it according to the appropriate procedures, which he will have learned, hopefully, in law school. These are essential forms of knowledge. But Hayek said there's other types of knowledge that are just as important as crucial and profoundly used all the time every day. The second one is what he called particular and local knowledge of time and place. Let me use an example as I tell my students. Okay, you graduate with your business degree, you get your entry-level job, and you're on the job the first day. And who greets you as you're there at the beginning of the day? The big boss. The big boss says, well, lad, here's a memo. Make me 30 copies and get it to my secretary in half an hour because I have a meeting with my, with my administrators. 
Well, here you are, your first day on the job, your big boss has noticed you, and guess what? First of all, even though you had full A's and a high GPA and earning your business degree, in this firm, you don't even know where the photocopy machine is. Well, you locate the photocopy machine. You put the originals in, you push in how many copies, you push the start button, and guess what? Nothing happens. You panic. The big boss, your first day is going to be your last. Someone comes along and says, what's wrong? Well, the, you have to know to do this, kid. And this other fellow kicks the side of the photocopy machine. The circuit is connected, and the copies start spewing out. Spewing out. Who, in anything they would have studied in a textbook, could tell them the particulars, the specifics of the localized time and place that at this moment in this company, because of a glitch in the photocopy machine, you have to, almost like in a cartoon fashion, kick it on the side so the contact is made and the copies are made. But that type of mundane and seemingly trivial knowledge is essential to get things done each and every way, every day in the workplace. What are the qualifications, characteristics, experiences, and abilities of the people who work under you if you're an executive in a company? If your supplier fails to deliver some component parts, who are alternative suppliers? What do you have an inventory that could be used instead, given that the supplier will not get to you for a few days and you can't stop production because you have commitments to your customers? What is it that consumers want? How do you know the specifics? If you introduce a new product, if you put something on sale, if you decide to open a new location, how will your competitors and rivals respond? Don't you, need to take, don't you need to take that into consideration in designing your own business and enterprise plans and strategies? Of course. That is the localized knowledge of time and place that people acquire on the spot through the textured circumstances and in interactions and which potentially is different and changing every day. Third, in later writings, Hayek emphasized a knowledge which he called our inarticulate or tacit knowledge, a knowledge that he copied or took from a, a philosopher of science chemist friend of his called Michael Piani. This is the kind of knowledge of knowing what to do and how to do and where to do and when to do, but which we find it difficult or impossible to articulate in either written or spoken words. This knowledge is used all the time. Let me use a trivial example. You have a problem with your automobile. You take it into the garage. You have the mechanic look at it. He tells you to open the hood, turn the engine on. You step next to him. The engine is going. And he says, don't worry. I've been working on cars for years. I know exactly what the problem is. Come back in a half an hour, and it'll be ready. I'll have it running as good as new. And you say, well, what's wrong with it? Don't worry, I, 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 I hear it. You're hearing nothing, but he says he hears it. That's knowledge that he's gotten by just the doing of it, like an osmosis. Now, whether he can explain to you in words what he somehow has the right feel as to what's wrong with your car, do you really care if he can explain it to you? As long as he can get the job done and have you back on the road so you can get to work or meet some essential appointment? Of course. That type of tacit and inarticulate knowledge is in all of us, which we use every day in ways we never even think about. And not only are these different types of knowledge, but they're layered in each one of us. Each one of us has this knowledge, and we use them in different forms and combinations, in ever-changing con content as we learn new and changing things every day. Hayek's point was that the only people who can effectively use these types of knowledge in these complementary, layered, and changing ways are the people in their respective corners of the market participating in a division of labor. They either use their divided knowledge that is dispersed and decentralized among the minds of all of them, or the knowledge is not used. So how then do we coordinate all that people are doing in their respective corners of the market with the knowledge that they possess with others don't? In a world of specialization that now extends to a global division of labor, of not just hundreds or thousands or millions, but now a global market of billions. And Hayek's response was the price system. It is not necessary for you to know all your customers, for every businessman to know all the particulars of his rivals and why they want to use resources instead of him and what their uses would be. He doesn't need to know why the customers want to buy a product or some resource he can supply to them. It is necessary and it is sufficient if they each can express a value that they place upon it, 
as a minimum common informational denominator that enables that individual as consumer, producer, supplier, demander to estimate what something is worth, what it would cost to get or to produce, whether it would be profitable or not, or how they ought to modify their, 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 their activities as consumer and producer given the relative valuations placed upon the means to your ends and everyone else's. Prices have work to do. They act, as Hayek said, as a telecommunication system by which we are all bound together, speaking to each other through prices without ever being next to each other in virtually all circumstances as we are separated by both time and space. That is the profound importance of the market system without which the market cannot effectively function. Hayek's point was that this type of dispersed, decentralized, particular and unique knowledge that exists only in the minds of every member of society can never be collected, integrated, coordinated, passed on to the planners. Certainly the localized knowledge in time and place by the time it was passed up and evaluated and judged and combined into a revised plan would be out of date by the time it came back down to most people. And how do you even communicate the inarticulate knowledge to planners for them to use effectively in the central plan that they will then assign you a particular task to perform? Either we allow people the freedom and latitude and liberty to use their knowledge as they see fit, or it does not get used. And it is insufficient for them to use their latitude of liberty of personalized knowledge and to coordinate their actions through the marketplace. That is why first Mises and then Hayek argued that socialism as a comprehensive system of central planning is inherently unworkable in the past, in the present, and in the future. There is no practical, effective alternative to a functioning, competitive market economy and its institutions of prices and competition. And finally, Mises and Hayek also emphasized that the, that the critics of socialism of the 19th century were right. That to nationalize the means of production, to place everything in the hands of the government, to impose a central plan upon all to which all are expected to conform, and to serve reduces each individual to a cog in the machine of the government controller. There is no such liberty in that. Each individual must give up their own plans, their own purposes, their own goals, their own relative valuations to conform and to be confined within the hierarchy of the planner's goals. And there ends liberty as man has wanted it, has dreamed of it, and for a short time in the era of market liberalism, achieved degrees of it. And that is the choice. It's not over just a system of production and efficiency, but liberty and tyranny. And that is essential and has been a core contribution of the Austrian economists. Thank you very much.